The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to our presentation today. We're going to be talking about effective presentation techniques. Uh, it's about 12.02, so we're going to go ahead and get started. It looks like a lot of people are, are uh, logging on right now, so I'm just going to go ahead and get started on uh, on the hey, Jason. presentation. Hey, We've got a couple of special about that. with us today. We've got uh, Mike Blackham is one of my panelists today. Mike from Geneva Pipe and Precast. Anything you want to say to the fine people today, Mike, before we get going? Uh, happy Friday. Hope everyone's staying safe. That's about it. Yeah. I think Randy was going to jump on as well. Randy, are you there yet? Have you jumped on? Yeah, I'm on. Um, I just want to say... Sorry, I'm glad I wasn't late because I know Jason's been known to say things about me if I'm not on. And uh, why they may be true, I don't appreciate them. That is 100% accurate. I do tend to say things about Randy when he doesn't show up. So I am glad that you're on time as well because I would have had to give your introduction for you. Well, let's jump right in. We've got a lot that we want to cover today. And so I'm going to jump in right here and get started. Just telling you a little bit about myself. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I am a licensed engineer. I have bachelor's and master's degrees from University of Utah and 18 years of experience in the engineering field. Started at surveying, worked through land development in the public sector as the Morgan County engineer. And then I went into consulting, started my own business, and now I am the marketing director for the, uh, for the Mountain States Concrete Pipe Association. So uh, for those that aren't familiar with us and, and who our members are, I just want to recognize them at this point. Uh, I already introduced you to Mike Blackham of Geneva Pipe and Precast, a Northwest Pipe company. Uh, Geneva Pipe has plants in the St. George area, Orem, and Salt Lake. Uh, Old Castle Infrastructure, we've got plants up in, uh, they have plants in Ogden, Idaho Falls, and the Boise area. And so these are our two main member companies of the Mountain States Concrete Pipe Association. We cover Utah and Idaho. We'd also like to give some recognition to our cement suppliers who also sit on our advisory committee, help us out, uh, provide us with a lot of assistance uh, throughout the year. And so I wanna recognize Ashgrove and Wholesome Cement Companies. Uh, they're great. Uh, for those of you that this is your first time, this is what I call our uh, pajama presentation series because every week I give this presentation in my pajamas. Uh, and I, I always show you a picture of what my pajamas are this week of what I'll be, uh, what I'll be be wearing, so I'll show that in just a moment. But the, the three purposes of these are, one, we want to build some technical skill. We're hoping that during this time, if there's, you know, if you're working from home and you're uh, kind of away from things and maybe some things are slowing down, I hear from a lot of you that things aren't slowing down, but uh, the idea behind this is that we're hoping we can help you build some technical skill that will help you in your career. And even though we are the Concrete Pipe Association, we want to provide things similar to what we've got today, uh, you know, things about that will help you in your career, not just with uh, pipe or drainage pipe related, concrete pipe related. Today, we're gonna be talking about effective presentations. And so we wanna, we wanna make you better in your career. Um, the, the other one is we just hope this can provide you with a little bit of a break. And uh, while we wanna inform you, we're hoping to entertain a little bit and provide you with, uh, I like to use humor in my presentations. And so uh, well, hopefully we can, we can give you a little bit of break from what's going on in your life and in the world and, and uh, give you a fun little Time here, and it also helps me be the center of attention, which is what I crave all the time. So, um, this is this is what I'm what my my uh, pajamas look like today. This is what I'm wearing. I'm wearing my Batman jammies, so I'm really excited about that. Um, so if uh, if you want to, if you ever want to go fight crime with me, I've got my Superman onesie jammies that I wore two weeks ago, and now I've got my Batman ones. Uh, just a little bit about how the format hey, of this works. Yeah. I don't I don't know if you're on, Randy. I don't see anything other than your home screen effective presentations. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. And and really, I can't imagine that people aren't like they need to see the Batman jammies. So they have to see the Batman out. jammies. Um, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to troubleshoot this and see what the heck is going on here. All right. I am Mike and Mike and I will describe Mike and I'll describe this as you're bringing it up. But perfect. It it kind of is a it kind of is a little bit disturbing. So, um we I just would kind of warn everyone that these are graphic images. 
and you <laughs> may need to look away. Um, it uh, Batman doesn't have a mustache like that. Um, I don't think. Does he wear glasses? And also... there's see. All right, let's try. There seems this. to be yeah. something wrong with the bottoms too. I'm gonna I'm try not sure. things here and see. Um, yes, you got it now, Jason. <laughs> okay, is this working now, now? Now it's time to. Yeah, it's time to look away if you're squeamish. Perfect. I'm gonna. Don't let any children in your office right now, please. <laughs> yes, if you have young children, please look away. I'm going through these other slides. I apologize. I had to start over there. This is part of the. Uh, this is all part of effective presentation techniques. Have a backup plan, and uh, and rehearse. Okay, so here you are. Here you have a picture of the Batman jammies. There you have it, right there. Okay. So um, while we're while you're you're feasting your eyes upon those Batman jammies, I have a poll here. A little poll question that we're gonna do. And this is my kind of trial, the, the way that I try the poll every week. I wanna know how many of you are also, also wearing your pajamas. So I'm gonna launch that poll right now. Let me choose it here. So. I'm going to launch that one. Are you currently wearing your jammies? Yes, Team Jammies for Life is one. No, but I wish I was. And uh, the last one, no, I am an adult at the height of class and sophistication. Why would I wear pajamas to work? Okay, that seems like most of you. Um, but it looks like we're going up every week. The first week we had about 10%, last week was 13, and this week 16% of you are saying that you are in your jammies today. So congratulations, that's exciting. Thank you for sharing there. That's a good test. We're going to have some poll questions throughout. The, how this works uh, and, and the format that I like to go through on this is that if you have any questions, please post those in the questions box on there. We'll go through and answer those at the very end. Also, this uh, presentation tracks your attentiveness and it sees if you're paying attention, whether you're uh, you know, doing other things at the same time, whether you're answering and responding to the poll questions. Those are um, those are things that it tracks, and every week I choose whoever the highest attentive was, or the most attentive and the most interested learner. It says uh, I'll send you a twenty-five dollar gift card to Amazon. So I want everyone hopefully to pay attention, and I'm hoping that that will uh, that will do it for you. Okay, Jason. Yes. I don't know if your screen went back. Okay, there now? you go. Okay, there we go. Yeah, good. Sorry, it seems to be kicking out the screen every time I load a poll, so I will keep that in mind. I appreciate that feedback. This is it's never done this before, so we're going to do our best to, to work through it. Okay, all right, so we're going to talk today about uh, presenters, all right? And the three takeaways that I'm hoping to, that you take away from this is, first, what makes a good presenter? We're going to talk about what makes a good presentation, and then we're going to provide some tips to make those presentations better. All right, so um, first question that I usually ask when I talk to people, and I want you to think about for a moment, is why are presentations important? A few things that I've come up with over the years as I've talked about this is that presentations are a very effective way to communicate with groups. Right. It's also a way that sometimes we're giving an accountability of what we've been doing and providing an update uh, to people. So it's a good accountability check. And it's also an opportunity for us to try to persuade people. When I was the Morgan County engineer, I was giving a lot of presentations to planning commissions, city councils and things. And I and, and I, I I had to persuade them if I wanted them to do something and, and act upon something. I had to use my persuasion to do that right now. How we present ourselves is very important. We present every day, so we're all we're all presenters, whether we like it or not. And and first impressions do matter, so it's very important that we're rehearsed and that we practice and that when we're presenting information, whether it's informally or formally, uh, we're putting forth our we're putting forward our best best foot so that people will take us seriously. Um, like you know, giving a webinar series in your pajamas, wearing a Batman cowl, you know, like being extremely professional and taking yourself seriously. One, one rule that I always live by 
is this. There are no boring topics, only boring presenters. Okay, so keep that in mind as we go through this. That's my mantra and, and something that I, I hold to a lot. All right, right now, what I want everybody to do is I want you to visualize and think for just a minute on your favorite teacher, the best teacher you've ever had, your absolutely favorite teacher. Um, what, what was it about this teacher that made them great? All right, I just, I, I want to know what you think it was that made them a good presenter. Okay, so think about that for a second, right? Think about it and, and, uh, and I'm going to ask, actually, I'm going to ask Mike and, and Randy. Mike, I'll ask you first since you've been thinking about this. What, tell me about your favorite teacher briefly and, and what it was that made them great. Yeah, Randy, so I thought about it and I had two and they were my favorite because of the same reason. So that's why I can go with two. Perfect. And ironically, as an engineer, it's kind of funny. My worst subjects was English and art. Hmm. Yeah, those were my two favorite teachers. So I think it speaks volumes about them. And my, the reason they were my favorite teacher is because the way they taught and the way they graded, they did not grade everybody on the same level. So for instance, I sucked at art, period. I was horrible. Yeah. But I still had the ability to get an A because he graded me on my skill level and how much effort I put into my art rather than grading the art itself. Mm -hmm. And that was the same with the English teacher. He graded me on my papers and the content of the paper, not necessarily the grammatical part of the paper. So that's why I liked my teachers, those two teachers the best. I like it. Randy, anything you'd like to share? Um, for me, it was simple. If they made a connection with me outside of teaching, then I would, I would listen to them. Excellent. Excellent. My my uh, my favorite teacher was similar to what Mike was talking about. I I did not like AP European history. It, it was just kind of a boring topic. I was never really that into history. As I'm going through AP European history, I never I, I never thought to myself, well, when when am I ever going to really need this? There's like there's no way America would ever like you know I don't know elect a fascist president or uh, there's no way we would ever have like a a pandemic sweep across the world that could eradicate 10% of the world's population. Like that just doesn't happen anymore. That's just ridiculous. Why do I need this information? But my teacher, she really made it come alive because she would, she would dress up in the characters. And so when she was lecturing about Napoleon, she gave the entire presentation dressed as Napoleon. When she was talking about the impact that William Shakespeare had on the world, she dressed up as Shakespeare and, and gave the soliloquies dressed as, as Shakespeare. She really made it come alive and, and she made that connection, kind of what Randy's talking about, you know, making a connection outside of uh, outside of the, the the learning material. I think that's good. Some of the things that, that I look at when I look at what makes a good presenter is, are they personable? Are they passionate? Are they excited about their uh, their 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 material? Are they confident? You know, confidence is a big deal with, with being a good presenter. What's the delivery like? How are they delivering it? Like I said, with my teacher, she used to dress up and be a you know, be be one of those characters. And that was that was a really good thing for me. And and lastly, like Randy and I touched on, they, they were able to make a connection, not just with the, the subject material, but connecting with the audience and, and the people that are there. So so right now we're going to do another poll real quick here. I'm going to try this out. This next poll is uh, I want you to rate your presentation skills on one to five, five being the best and one being the worst, okay? So I'm gonna open that up to everybody here. So, so if you're the best, I, I've got five, I'm basically the Muhammad Ali of presenting, four, people cry tears of joy when I present, three, I'm good enough for people to think I'm good enough, uh, two, people cry tears of sadness when I present, and one, let's be honest, I am an engineer after all, I am not a great presenter. So it sounds like most of the people here, as I look at this, it looks like a majority, about two thirds of you, you're about in that middle category there. You, you, you're you about, about middle of the ground. You're hoping to improve a little bit. That's good. That's good. Thank you for sharing that. I'm going to share my screen again hey, now. Hey, Jason. There, Randy. So one of the things I think we get caught up in is not everyone's going to give a PowerPoint presentation all the time or do what Jason does. But 
whether you're just meeting with developers or contractors or the city council or whoever, mm-hmm. it, you're always kind of giving a presentation. And so I think this is really good, even if even if it's not a PowerPoint, we've all got to we've all got to sell ourselves in our job. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with you more. We are we are at its heart, all of us salesmen. We, we're trying to persuade people uh, for things right, and present information so that people can make informed decisions. That's a lot of what we do as engineers. And so that's a very good point, Randy. We're going to be talking today about about some tips to, to have better presentations. And a lot of that is going to be in in uh, what we do in PowerPoint, things we can do in PowerPoint, but also be thinking about how you can implement some of these things. Some of them are more high level about you know, personality and what makes us uh, good presenters. And, and these five things, whether you're doing a, a PowerPoint presentation in front of a group of five people or 500 people, or whether you're just uh, giving an impromptu uh, presentation and, a, and a, I guess an explanation about a project to a planning commissioner or city council, it's all presentation. And these five things that make a good presenter should be remembered and tried to emulate uh, personable, passionate, confident, good delivery, and, and making a connection with those people. That's really important. So thank you, Randy, for bringing that up. I, I do agree with that. Okay, so let's let's move to the next one here and say, what makes a good presentation? And some of the things that I've come up with and that I've noticed over the years as I've given this is that... In my mind, the first thing is that that presentation is going to meet the audience's needs. It doesn't do me any good if I'm presenting uh, to a planning commission and, and I'm talking about things that don't really apply to what I'm trying to accomplish and or I'm speaking to a, plan, a, a city council. If I want them to take out a bond for a water line and I'm, I don't even give them any reasons why we need this water line, that's not meeting the audience's needs, right? Um, I like to to look at this as collaborative learning. Webinars are a little bit more difficult because it's me and and maybe a couple of panelists talking the whole time. But I feel like when you're in a in a good setting where you can learn together and you can build off of one another's ideas and comments, similar to what Randy just did there, you know, coming in and providing some some input and feedback on that we're all presenters all the time and we need to improve on that. Th- that's a collaborative learning process. And lastly, we've hit on this so many times, but a good presentation is one that makes a connection to to the people that you're presenting to. So those are important. Uh, We're going to be focusing on good, better, and best practices today. So some of us may think that we're good. Uh, I'm hoping that you can find things to make it better. And then if you're if you think you're in that better category, maybe we're going to look at at some things that we can do to be the best. You know, hopefully we're all looking to progress in our jobs every day. And I even even though I give a lot of presentations, I'm always looking for opportunities to improve and things that I can do better so that so that I can be the very best that I can be. So we're going to focus today on on good, better and best. We'll look at some good practices, what makes it better and how we can be the best. Okay. so first things first, we there are some things that you need to do even before you you get to the get to the place. Once we've set up, we know we're going to be giving a presentation. Here are a few things that I recommend that you look into and that you try to identify early on. First, what's your audience look like? Who are you going to be presenting this to? Is it is it technical people or is it people with very little technical experience? So you've got to identify that audience. How many people are they going to be? What I ask things like, um, you know, what's their background? How long have they been working with the company? Are they you know, are they old? Are they young? Because my message may change depending on who my audience is. I can't give the same presentation to every office or to every city or to every planning commission. You know, I have to go in and identify who these people are so that I'm already ahead at making that connection. I also like to ask what the format's going to be. Is it expected to be more of a, a one-hour lecture where I just talk the whole time? Is it going to be in a in a situation where I can I can collaborate with the team a little bit more where I can discuss and we have questions and answers and we 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 take times to have breakouts and work work things through. You know, what's the format of this presentation going to be? I, I like to ask a lot of questions about that. Once I know who my audience is and the format that I'm going to be giving there, that's when I do my preparation for my presentation, where I start putting together the content, where I outline it out, and then I start finding things that will work to that, whether it's stories, pictures, videos, different things like that. 
Um, that's what I like to do with, with preparing there. So, and then last is, is practice. Before we even get there, I'm hoping that we have practiced, practiced, practiced so that we feel very comfortable with the, with the content that we're delivering, right? That, that to me, and I, I say it over and over again, that, that confidence is important. And the way you're confident, confident is that you've been able to practice and you're familiar with the material and you know what you're talking about. So those are, those are some things that I like to do before I even, even step foot into the, into the arena to give a presentation there. All right, so now we've practiced, we've prepared, we know who our audience is. Now we gotta think about what do we gotta do when we're doing this presentation? What type of equipment do I need? So let's say we're doing a PowerPoint presentation and we, or we have some visual aids and things that we're gonna be doing, right? I always like to ask, do you have a projector? That's, an, that's always a good question to ask because if they don't and you need to do a PowerPoint, it's kind of hard to do it off of your laptop or your Surface or if you only brought a, a jump drive to put into a computer and they don't have a, a way to project it, either a, a screen or a TV or a projector, we could have a problem. I always look at, if, if I'm going to bring my own, I want to make sure I've got a, a projector that has enough lumens that it's going to be bright enough. Nothing worse than going into a into a room and having a really light projector where people can't see what you're trying to present. Uh, I, I prefer a wide angle so it doesn't have to be back too far. And so it can throw really to a really close wall and still have a big projection on that. Uh, the meeting room is important as well. What's the setup going to look like? What are the lights going to be? What's the light situation? Are you going to have lights on or off? I prefer to have them on uh, because I don't want people falling asleep during my presentation. So I try to change my presentation to make sure that it's one that I can give if the lights are on so that it's light. Um, light background, dark text, so that it'll stand out in a light room. And that's why it's important you have a strong projector with, with a lot of lumens there. Um, the setup, what's it going to look like? What's the room going to look like? What's the setup there? Uh, are you going to have a microphone? Do you need a microphone? Some people have big booming voices. Some people have really quiet voices. What, what do you need for that? So those are things to go through. When we look at good, better, best, I would say this is the worst situation here. You walk into a room, it's dark. You've got a dark screen there and no one can see the speaker, all right? We've got a little bit of improvement by, by illuminating the podium there so you can see the speaker at least. But I would say if we're going for better, you'd want to lighten up the room so that people could see it. And if we want to take it even one step further and go good, better, best, see how the difference is on that presentation with a light background? That's, a, that's kind of a big deal there for me. I like to have those light backgrounds with dark text, okay? So we're going to talk some PowerPoint basics here, but before we do, let's jump in to another poll question here. I want to know how often are you giving formal presentations? I'm just curious to see who we've got with us today. I just want to see what we've got here. Um, is it is it more than once a week, once a week, once a month, once a year, or rarely? These are the, the formal presentations, not necessarily what Randy's talking about, how we present every day, right? This is, I'm going up and presenting to my city council, my planning commission, or my, uh, um, you know, or I'm giving a presentation to a group of engineers at a conference. So it, it looks like most of you are, are kind of in the once a month or once a year, 25% uh, about 30% of you say about once a month. So that's a, that's a pretty good amount. Once a month, that's not bad. Um, about 45% of you say in about once a year. So still you give it a little bit. It's kind of hard to, to improve, you know, where you're, where you're only giving it once a year. So hopefully some of these tips can get you out in front of it. So when you have your next presentation, so thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it here. Let's get back to, to our presentation. I'm just going to talk about some basics and things that I've picked up over the years. Uh, with PowerPoint. All right. So what I always tell people is if you're using PowerPoint, you should show, don't tell anything you can to, to show them what you should do uh, in, instead of just telling and reading text and, and putting a lot of text on there. All right. I always like to put three takeaways. I've heard from many people that when you're giving an hour presentation or a 30 minute presentation or even a two hour presentation, we're really only able to to handle three things at a time, three main items. So what I do is I'll always identify what are those three takeaways? What do I want people to take from this presentation? And then I'll, and then I'll build those. I like to show them at the beginning and the end of my presentation. 
so that I show you what we're going to be talking about today. And then at the end, I summarize, this is what we've talked about today so that you know what those takeaways are. I've heard other people who don't like to do that, and that's fine. There's really no right or wrong way. As long as you're building your presentation around what are the three things that I want people to take away. If you want them to take away 10 things in an hour, you're going to be severely disappointed because they're only going to be able to handle three. So choose those three most important things and, and take those with uh, and build your presentation around it. Because any more than that, why not just schedule a follow-up presentation if you have more? All right. And, and lastly, rehearse. Go through it. Make sure your slides are showing up the way you want them to. Make sure that things are, are working correctly. All right. If you've got animations, make sure those animations are correct. If you've got videos, make sure they play correctly. Um, if you've got images, make sure they're coming in correctly. So there's a, a rule that I'm that I was taught that was the it's called the 555 rule. This is five bullets maximum per page, five words per bullet maximum five text slides maximum per presentation before you have some visual, like a picture or, or a video or some, some way to break it up. So uh, I think personally, this is the, the a pretty common rule, the 555 rule. Personally, I feel like that's kind of a lot. I try to adhere to the three to five rule, three to five, three to five, three to five. So I try to go between three and five. Um, I think if you're holding fast to five, that team seems to be a little bit uh, much. I try to hold it closer to three. And then I just a rule of thumb, if you're putting a PowerPoint presentation together, uh, one slide is typically equals one minute. So if you've got a 30 minute presentation, probably shouldn't have many more than 30 slides. That's a pretty good rule of thumb there. Uh, for the bullet points, okay, I like to use an animation to appear. Uh, I usually just use the animation or, or, or uh, fade uh, fade in animation there. Uh, I, I don't like those flashy, really fancy, you know, bouncing all over the screen. Those, those can be really, really distracting. All right. I also don't show all the bullets. I want people to, to focus on what I'm talking about now. And, and lastly, I will typically grayscale the other bullets so that what I'm talking about right now really stands out to the audience. All right. Um, we're going to take a quick break here and I'm going to, show you two tips for enforcing this six foot rule. I've heard a lot of people say, man, I was at the store the other day getting my essentials, getting doing my one trip for the for, for two weeks to get my essentials and no one was following the six foot rule. So I have two tips for y'all on how you can enforce, enforce the six foot rule. The first one is you can become an architect because nobody wants to be anywhere near an architect. Six foot is not a problem if you're an architect. The second rule, our second tip is this. You can do like this guy. Put a couple of foam noodles on your head and no one can get close to you. Uh, I think that was a pretty sharp way to do that. So I, I, I applaud that man. I saw that this morning and I thought I got to share this with these are people that are going to be really interested to know. All right. So when we talk about, about PowerPoint and we look at the three to five rule, this is a blatant violation of that, that uh, five, five, five rule here. Right, so when you look at it, this is one way to present information. It's a good way to present information, don't get me wrong. The people get what they need. This is what they, what they can see if we're talking rigid pipe versus flexible pipe. But let's look at a better way to do that, right? Maybe a better way is to have less text and allow the presenter to speak about each of these, right? So these are, this is a better, better way. And Randy, I'm gonna ask you, you a question real quick. How much do you pay per slide in PowerPoint? What are, what are you getting charged per slide? I don't think it costs me anything for an extra slide. Okay. So, um, all right, so it doesn't cost you anything. Mike, would you concur when you give a PowerPoint presentation? Are you charged per slide? I think I would agree with that. Okay, no PowerPoint. Charge bless their hearts, they don't charge you per slide. So feel free to use as many slides as you want. This is, uh, this is another way to do it, right? Keep it simple. Let's just focus on rigid pipe here. RCP, it's a structure better with soil. The quality control is done in the plant. For flexible pipe, these are your, your materials. It's a liner that requires the soil around it to be compacted to create the structure. The quality control is performed in the field, so it's installation sensitive. That's even a better way to do it. Right now, I'm going to show you what I consider to be the best way to present this information. 
right? I'm gonna use a visual aid. So how this works, if you look, you've got your flexible pipe system on the, on the left-hand side. The pipe itself is flexible. So if you've got a flexible pipe, as that, as that gets compressed, it's gonna wanna deflect outward. So it's very important that we build a stiff wall on either side of it to keep it from, from uh, deflecting. Now with a rigid system, if we load that, it's okay to have a little bit more flexibility on the side because the rigid pipe is not going anywhere because it is the structure. So to me, that's a much more efficient way of presenting that information, all right? Now, when we come to using visual aids and pictures, I am a big fan of using pictures to get my point across. A picture's worth a thousand words, right? So we, so if, if I can show it, instead of putting text on the screen, I wanna do that. I wanna use these pictures as best I can. However, there are some best practices on how we should be using pictures. For example, this is, a, this is an okay example. It's not the worst I've seen. I'll just say that. I once saw a video and Randy was at this training where this guy was giving us presentation on how to be an effective presenter. And I kid you not, he had five different images and two of them were videos. So he had three pictures and two videos all going at once on one slide. And that was when we all kind of started making the joke about, hey man, PowerPoint doesn't charge you per the slide. You ought to consider maybe uh, uh, maybe splitting all those up. So instead of showing it like this, if it's important enough to show a picture of, right? I say give it its own slide and then talk about that picture. If you've got four slides on a screen or four pictures on a screen and you're gonna talk about those, just, just give them their own and talk about those, right? Like this one, for instance, I've never seen any other you know, superheroes in any other pipe material, but here's Spider-Man and Concrete Pipe. So clearly the best. Anyway. Is that, is that you, Jason? That is not me, actually. I know, I know I've lost a little bit of weight this last year, but no, I'm not quite that slender yet. We'll get there. I don't know if anybody wants to see me in a, in a, a spandex Spider-Man outfit, but I don't know. Give me another year. We'll see what happens. Um, you know, then talk about your, uh, your, your quarantine, uh, thing here. This is, this is great. If you get the, uh, get the COVID and you can't, your wife won't let you back in the house. You, we can, we can uh, provide you with an option there. Right. Or, uh, if you're into BMX biking, here's a, here's a picture of someone doing a, a, a loop de loop there in a, in a, in a concrete structure. That's kind of cool. Uh, this is what I'm hoping to do in my backyard at some point you know, really utilize that concrete pipe love that I have, all right? Now, ineffective PowerPoint, okay? I'm gonna show you an ineffective PowerPoint. An ineffective PowerPoint presentation is one in which the presenter includes every word that he or she will say in the presentation on each slide and then proceeds to read the slide verbatim. Better yet is when a presenter turns his or her back to the audience and reads the slide because they did not position their computer in a way that allows him or her to look at the audience while reading. The audience will inevitably read ahead and zone out. Trust me, you do not want that. Okay, that's ineffective PowerPoint. Effective PowerPoint is one that's going to outline your key points. It's going to engage the audience, and I think most importantly, keep the focus on the presenter. We want that focus to be on that presenter to make sure that, that they're getting that, able to get that connection with the audience. That personal connection is so important. So we wanna make sure we can keep that focus on the presenter, all right? So um, I'm gonna talk next about some visual tips, some things that you should, you should consider when you're putting your PowerPoint presentation together, all right? So what I like to do is, is I like to have just a simple layout as you can see from this presentation that I've been doing, it's been very simple, um, very easy to read. It's not too flashy. The animations haven't been distracting. I want them to focus on the words that I'm saying, not necessarily what's going on on the screen and what's, what's happening all around them, right? I want it to be laser focused on that. I always recommend a light background. That's, that's uh, for a couple of reasons. I touched on it in the beginning. It's, if, if the lights have to be out, it's much, or if the lights have to be on, or if you're able to keep the lights on, which is preferred, you want a light background with dark text because it really pops a lot more. And it's, it's much easier to read, actually, if you have a light background and dark text is much easier to read than a dark background and a light text. 
Another thing that I, I always recommend is when you're making your PowerPoint, it should be printable. Sometimes someone's going to want to print these out and have notes, or maybe you want to print them out and provide notes to somebody else. So if you're, if it's printable, you can print those and hand them to people so that they can have them for future reference. Uh, but I always say if it can't show up on, on printing six slides to a page, it's probably too much text or it's too many pictures or it's too small. And, and you really need to rethink that because you want it to show up when you print it. And if you have 50, 60 slides, you don't want to be printing out 50 pages. If you do six or eight slides to a sheet, then you can get it done in, you know, eight to 10 pages. So that's not bad. So consider that when you're putting your PowerPoint together on, on what it should look like visually. All right. I'm going to now show you some examples of some of my favorite PowerPoint um, slides, and I, I hope that you enjoy these as much as I do because these are are just next level awesome. This is an actual slide. Uh, this is a PowerPoint slide that was uh, that's given by some government entity talking about you know business coordination and whatnot. Now this one isn't nearly as bad as my absolute favorite. All right, if you were to go and Google worst PowerPoint slide ever, this is what comes up. This is an actual PowerPoint slide from a from a, a presentation given by the uh, I believe it's the Defense Acquisition University was giving this uh, to the uh, Department of Defense and this was their slide. Okay, I I mean it is amazing. I'm 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 impressed honestly at how bad it is. Like it's my my whole philosophy in life is you 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 should be the very best or the very worst at something. Uh, either way, you're going to be remembered and someone's going to write a book about you. So. This is just absolutely, it's so bad, it's almost good. I, I'm almost impressed that they were, that they, that somebody thought this was a good idea to make this a PowerPoint slide. So uh, consider that uh, as, the, as the worst PowerPoint slide ever. Too much going on. You're not going to be able to print it. It's not going to, I mean, you could print it if you had a, a, a plotter and you put three or four of these together. Um, it might be able to show up, but you've got to figure out a way to break it down and smooth it out. So I, I love this slide for so many reasons. All right, this, uh, I'm gonna show you some other slides that I've seen people actually in, in my industry give these presentations, all right? We taught one of these extremely technical engineers how to change the background on his slides. When he learned about that, he went crazy. Have no idea what the significance is of the snowflakes, but um, he wanted to have snowflakes in the back of his his uh, slide. Not only was it enough that it has white and blue background, but then he also chose a conflicting and contrasting blue-green color scheme to go along with it. The white blends in, it, it blurs out. This is a terrible slide. He also gave one about in uh, compaction requirements and soils. Uh, this is another one that he did. Uh, again, it wasn't enough that the background was flashy. He then had to use a gold, a blue, a different shade of blue, black, and orange text on this. Uh, I, I mean, again, sometimes things are so bad you're almost impressed. This one is just a really, really bad way to convey information. Not only is it a lot of information on the page, which I understand sometimes you want to show a table and you need to explain what that table is. I get it. I'm, I'm sympathetic. I've got specs and things when we're giving technical presentations. It's really hard to present some of this stuff without having these tables in their entirety. However, if you're going to do that, let's be smart about how, it, how we do that. And it's not going to give people headaches when they look at it because this background and this image is just too much. All right, this is another one. This is the example of back, dark background with white text. Um, compare this, this is this is what it looks like here. Compare this to this, right? The, the, it, it's night and day difference. Uh, obviously night and day because of dark and light. Anyway, oh, bad joke. I've been around my kids too long. They think that stuff's funny, but I don't expect any of you to laugh at it. So. Um, night and day difference between dark background and light text versus light background and dark text. So let's talk a little bit about visual aids and what we should do. I said earlier that a picture's worth a thousand words. I mean, a video is worth even more than that. So 
when we look at, at using visual aids in PowerPoint, I have some recommendations and some suggestions on how you can get the most out of those. All right, if you're gonna use media, which is anything that's got sound, uh, whether it's an audio file or a video, and if the video has sound, right, always embed that in PowerPoint, all right? I know a lot of people who will link, will link to a YouTube video. I can't tell you how many times I've been sitting in a presentation and I just and they say, oh, here it is, and they go to click, and the Wi-Fi is not working. They don't have the Wi-Fi password. The internet went down. Um, they the 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 connection's too slow to show the PowerPoint through the presentation. They have to shut their PowerPoint presentation down to go to another pay page to look at the video. These things are all distracting. They all take the audience out, and it it limits your ability to make that connection. So. Please, 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 if you take nothing else from this presentation, please, please embed your media. I hope I don't have to go down to the City Engineers Conference next year and see yet another presenter not embedding their media and trying to work through the technical difficulties of connecting and, and, and clicking and, and going. That, it's just, it takes people out. It's so hard to do. So please embed your media. If you have questions on how to do this, I'm gonna talk a little bit about it, but if you have further questions you want me to help you, I am more than happy to sit down with you and visit with you on how to do that because it's really, really easy and it can make a huge difference in the flow and the the the, the way your presentation looks to, to the people that you're giving it to. Um, so do not link it. That is that is my one key there. Don't link link your media. All right. Also, don't rely on audio. I gave a presentation. One of my first presentations at this job. It was pretty funny. Uh, I, I was giving a presentation at the University of Utah, and I had just finished watching Parks and Recreation. I just finished it, and I was and I thought, you know, it'd be funny. I have all these these funny uh, clips from Ron Swanson, and everybody ro loves Ron Swanson, the world favorite libertarian. And Ron Swanson gets in there. And I put all these videos of him saying all these funny quotes. And, and I'm like, all right, I'm going to go in with these college kids. They're going to think I'm so cool. It's going to be awesome. And, and I get there and I'm like, okay, I need to plug this in. I'm going to need audio. And they're like, oh yeah, there's no audio in this room. So if they, if, if, if you can play it, it's going to have to play from your, uh, from your, uh, your laptop. And I'm like, there's 250 people in this room. Like there's no way they're going to be able to hear it on my little surface. And they're like, well, can you do it without audio? And I'm like, I guess. So I relied on audio and I got burned. Um, I tried to salvage it by me doing all the quotes, all the Ron Swanson quotes. It's just not the same coming from uh, some weird, you know, some liberal weirdo like me when you want to hear a, a, a mustachioed libertarian talk about, about the government. So anyways, that was, uh, that was a disaster for me. I learned very early on, do not rely on audio and always have a backup plan. If you get into a room and you realize if you forgot to ask the question, now I ask the question, am I going to have a projector? Am I going to have a screen? Am I going to have audio connection? You know, am I, is there going to be a microphone? I always ask those questions now, but I had to learn the very, very hard way and you should always have a backup plan. All right. So let's talk about adding a video clip and how you, how you embed those in uh, and how we get these video clips. All right. When you're considering adding a video clip, you should always look for one that's good quality, right? You don't want it to be grainy and really choppy. That's always bad, it's distracting. So make sure it's a good quality video, all right? Make sure it's relevant and it's, it can teach or there's one exception. I sometimes will add a video clip in just to kind of relax and have a break. When we're doing extremely technical presentations, it can be really, really heavy for some of these people. So if you if you take a minute, to just show a funny clip of, of something like I was doing with the Ron Swanson clips, you know, uh, a joke or someone, I always like to show fail videos, people falling down, um, dude perfect with their trick shots. I've got presentations where I show those. It's just a way to break things up and break up the monotony of the technical presentation and get them to relax a little bit and take a deep breath before we move on. So I like to download my videos from YouTube. If I find a YouTube a video on YouTube that I like, you can download them. There's a few that I've used. Uh, I used to use YTD Downloader, but now they charge. What I liked about YTD Downloader though, is that if I downloaded the video from YouTube, and there were some that had copyright things that wouldn't let you download, but um, 
what I really liked about this program was that if I downloaded a five minute clip uh, or a five minute video, and I only wanted a 30 second clip because my, my whole thing is I don't ever try to show a video longer than 30 seconds. I think people, people's attention spans wane and, and even 30 seconds is a long video clip. So consider that. And this, this program allowed you to download it and then clip it to the area where you wanted it. So it was all a two in one. I really like that. Now that they charge and they're not free, I don't love that. Also, when I did try to pay for it though, uh, it sent a fraud alert to, to Randy. And so, uh, I decided not to buy it because I thought, well, if this is coming from an untrusted place in Russia, maybe I shouldn't be doing that. So uh, I shut that down. I tried to keep vid. I, I did this just the other day. This is one that's online. You just copy the link in YouTube in there and uh, keep vid.ch. You'd copy the link and it'll just download it in MP, MP4 format for you. And uh, then WinX YouTube downloader is one that's a program that you can download. This is one that Randy uh, uses that he told me about. I just downloaded it. I haven't used it much yet, but I do like it. It reminds me of YTD Downloader. It's free, so that's good. Uh, if you want to clip your videos, you're going to need a separate uh, you know, third-party software to do that, either Windows Movie Maker or something like that, to clip those down and edit it a little bit. So consider that. Your, your WinX doesn't do that in, in, in the program. But um, those are three that I've used. There's plenty online if you just Google how to download from YouTube, uh, but keep those in mind. Uh, when you put them into your PowerPoint, it's basically just a drag and drop. If you've got it in a file, it's no different than a, than a, uh, than an image. You just drag it into your slide and drop it in there and then it embeds it. It makes your files really, really large. So if you have a lot of videos, I have some, some presentations that have all of my videos embedded into there and they're, they're upwards of about one gig, one gigabyte on that. So it's, it's pretty big. It can be a little bit, um, overwhelming. So consider that if you're going to be copying and pasting if you i always use my own laptop where i can but if i have to put it on a jump drive and put it on someone else's laptop i want to i always get there early to make sure i can go through and make sure that all my videos still play and that it transferred correctly so embedding videos and audio does make your file your your powerpoint larger but it's it also makes it go smoother when it works so uh this is this is something that i that i actually learned um, between serif font and sans serif font. The serif font is one that has the little tails on it. And with those tails, they're, they're kind of a fancier font, like a Times New Roman. I hate serif fonts. I'm not a big fan. Uh, I prefer a sans serif font, like a good Arial or Calibri or Tahoma. Uh, if you want to get really crazy, uh, go ahead and mix in a little bit of Verdana. That's a great one. But a sans serif font is going to be thicker. All It's got a uniform width around it. And I know it's kind of weird that we're getting to this level, but if you notice the sans serif uniform width all the way around the letter, the serif font is uh, narrower at spots so that it can have that tail and that flare and have that kind of fanciness about it. The serif font, depending on the projector you're using, it can get lost. It can get washed out a little bit. So I always recommend doing everything in a serif font. If you are in a sans serif font, if you notice, PowerPoint defaults to a sans serif font. I believe the newer versions, of, the older versions used to default to Arial. The newer ones, I believe, default to uh, Calibri as your, as your main body font. But it, it is also a, a, a sans serif, so I recommend that. I know a lot of times we want to put emphasis on things and we think if we write in capitals, it's, it's better to provide emphasis. Word to the wise, underlining or bolding words is much better than all capitals because writing in all capitals is more difficult to read. Uh, my suggestion is to always use a large font size. Don't use like this, a 10 or 12 point font size, 28 to 32 minimum, depending on the type of font you're using. I always tell people that if you if you use this, this font size, if you have a smaller font on there, it's almost like people are, uh, you know, you're, you're, it's almost like you're trying to hide something from people. That's kind of the thought process they go through. They see that small font and they go, oh, it's the fine print. What are they trying to hide from me? So be smart about your font size. You don't want that really small font there. All right. Now, we've talked a lot about presentation and tips and techniques on PowerPoint. But what happens when we get into a presentation and we're talking to someone who just doesn't have a clue what we're talking about? 
when we're presenting to maybe a city council who has no experience in this technical realm. Or we're, we've been invited to speak at our kids' school and we go in there and we're talking over all of their heads. I'm sure a lot of us have been in there, right? So the, the key is, I'm gonna give you a couple of points and suggestions here on what you can do when you're talking to people to make sure they're like my good buddy Drax the Destroyer from Guardians of the Galaxy. Drax the Destroyer, if you remember, uh, he, he always says, nothing goes over my head. My reflexes are too fast. I will catch it. So with that in mind, why don't we do another poll? I'm curious to know, when you are presenting, are you presenting more to fellow technical personnel or are you presenting more to people with little technical background? I'm curious to see what the makeup is today on who's on this call. Wow. Numbers coming in here. It looks like, I'll give you a little bit more, it looks like about 90% of you have voted. Um, it, it looks like a little bit more, a majority are little to no technical background. So 56% it says of people with little technical background and 44% are to fellow technical personnel. So I'm gonna give you some idea on some ideas now, some tips on how we can relate technical data. All right, and technical information because it can be really, really difficult if people aren't understanding what we're what we're saying and things are going over their heads. So this is our key to help help our audience be more like Drax and have those fast reflexes there. Okay. When we're relating technical information, what I always do is, and I did this actually last night. I was giving a presentation um, this morning and I, I asked my wife if I could give a presentation to her and if I could just work it out on her. So I always practice on civilians. Someone who has very little technical experience and doesn't really know what you do for a living. So children, parents, uh, spouses, friends, you know, I like to practice on, on people who, if I'm not gonna be talking to a bunch of engineers, I wanna know that it's gonna be well received and then get their feedback from it. So that's a good way to do it. Practice on someone who doesn't have that, all right? I will be completely honest with you. I've sat in it in presentations before where I had no idea what they were saying, but for some reason I didn't feel lost because they had so much energy and excitement. And I think that if you are just slowly draining on and drooling, on, people lose interest and that might be why they're not able to grasp what, what you're talking about because there's just no energy and excitement. If they're excited and you have that energy and they're able to really listen and, and really focus on what you're saying, there's gonna be a much better chance that they're gonna be able to, to understand what you're saying and what you're, what you're trying to get across. So use that. Um, there's another principle that I like to highlight and I'm just gonna go through this very quickly because we're running out of time. But, uh, and I wasn't planning on going into great detail. If, if someone would like to at the end, I'm gonna have a survey after this presentation that you can take. If there's any any things, I know there's a lot of information I'm throwing at you today. This is just the overarching kind of that, that table of contents view. If there's anything that you would like more information on, or if you think it would be good to have a, a presentation that just delves into one aspect of this, um, you know, let me know in that survey that I'm gonna send out after the webinar. Uh, I'd love to talk about any of these topics and delve into them a little bit more if you think that would be helpful for you. So just consider that in the survey. Be honest with what you'd like to hear more about what, what I talked about today, if anything. Maybe, maybe we covered it all well. But defeats by Dell Carnegie, this is what it means. Basically, the principle behind this is that everybody learns differently, right? Even engineers, even when we're getting technical, this can be expounded not just to, to people with little technical background, but even those when we're, when we're talking to technical people. Everybody learns differently, and everybody has that connection made differently. So DEFEATS is an acronym, and it stands for Demonstrations, Examples, Facts, Exhibits, Analogies, Testimonials, and Statistics. So it depends on how these people learn that you're talking to. You may want to delve into that and have a few of these ready to go, a few demonstrations. Some people like to see the hands-on part of that. Some people want to hear about examples. Other people want to just hear what other people are doing. What, what, give me some testimonials. You know, what's Ogden City doing? What's Provo City doing? What, what's Farmington City doing, right? Like, like, what are all these other cities doing? Give me some testimonials of what they're saying, right? These are all things that you can do. I always say like the analogy that I've used before when I'm talking to, to children or people about that don't understand concrete and cement, they always call concrete cement. Oh yeah, I just, I tripped and fell on the cement. 
I always use the analogy of it's like baking a cake where concrete is the cake and cement is the flour and the eggs are the aggregate and the water is the water. And when you mix it together and, and, and bake it, then it, it becomes a cake. And that's that, you know, just an analogy, you're relating something back to what people know, right? That's the, the idea of an analogy. This is a great, great tool to use. It's something that I have, I've given presentations nationally on, on this defeats and how you can, uh, you know, relate to people better. So that's something that if you guys want to hear more about, I'd be happy to, to delve into that more at a later date. So when you're giving your delivery, don't ever apologize. Don't ever say, oh, I'm sorry, this is a really boring topic because, as I said earlier, no boring topics, only boring presenters, right? The ums and the uhs, try to eliminate those as much as possible. The best way to do that is to practice over and over and over again and rehearse and feel confident and comfortable with it. If you're umming and uhing, it sounds like you really, really don't know what you're talking about, right? Include breaks. I like to have little breaks, as you've seen through this. I've tried to break it up with polls, with pictures, with with uh, little stories. Include a break. When you're giving technical information, you want them to have a little bit of a, a breather. Like, okay, that was really heavy. Every you know five or ten minutes, have a chance for them to kind of catch their breath a little bit, right? Uh, a few other just tips as you're going through the delivery. Try to move around a little bit if you, if your situation allows you to. I know you can't see me because I've got my webcam turned off, but I've been walking around my office giving this whole presentation. So uh, I, I like to move a lot. Um, you know, move around if possible. That allows you to make that connection, and it it makes the audience feel like you're involved a little bit more. Show some excitement and some energy, right? That's really important to get people in. This was uh, when the Indians won their third game in the World Series, and they went up three to one uh, in 2016. So, uh, yeah, good times. Don't don't bother asking me how that one played out because uh, it broke my heart. Uh, anyways, make eye contact, right? Making eye contact with people when you're giving a presentation whether there's three people or 300 people, do what you can to make eye contact with as many people as possible. It goes a long way, right? I like to rehearse and know how much time it's going to take so that I don't run out of time at the very end, right? So know how much time it's going to take. Factor in some questions and answers and some of those things. I always start with a bang and I try to get off to a good start by telling a story or engaging the audience early, whether it's through poll questions or, or, uh, or, or some activity, something to get people, uh, you know, pulled in from the beginning. Start with a bang, and then at the end, I like to wrap it up in with a with a little bow. You know, tie it up with a conclusion. Sell some things, anything. Challenge them. Leave them with an idea. You know, tell them. You know, ask them if you could follow up later. Something like that. Always have a good end, right? You don't want your last slide to be well. I got five more slides, but it looks like we're out of time. So I guess we'll just end here. That's a really poor way to end your presentation. So keep that in mind. You need to rehearse it and have something at the end that you want to that you want to leave them with. I'm going to leave you uh, with with this this short little story. I gave this presentation to a conference one time, and then the next day, um, one of my competitors showed up and gave a presentation, and they violated almost every single rule that they started out by apologizing because it was a really boring topic. They then followed up, followed that up with saying, um, showing like five or six pictures per slide. They had really small font. They read from the text that they had on the slide. It was actually almost comical. It was almost like we had planned it. Like like I had seen their presentation. And I went ahead and said everything that they did and, and tried to point it out wrong. But it was it was just kind of funny for a lot of people that they, they saw me giving these effective presentation techniques, and then my com competitors violated almost every single one of them. They also, just to, to summarize and, and tie this back in, they ran out of time at the end and said, well, it looks like I didn't get through anything, so we'll just end there. This is a good stopping point. Thanks for your time. I'm gone. Um, as I mentioned before, I like to end with my three takeaways. Hopefully, you've learned today what it, what it takes to make a good presenter and understand that we are all presenters and what makes a good presentation, and we went over tips to make it better. I want, just before everybody leaves, I'm going to ask one more um, one more poll question, because I'm, I'm curious to know, what part of a presentation has the biggest impact on you? Is it the content? Is it the visual presentation, like the PowerPoint and the, the uh, things that they're showing you? Or is it the presenter and the delivery? Which one is the most, has the biggest impact on you?
We'll wait for just a couple more seconds here. It looks like about 80% of you have voted. Okay. That's interesting. I was thinking it would be a little bit more balanced. 9% of you said the content, 6% said visual presentation, and 86% said that it's the presenter or the delivery that, that has the biggest impact on you. That's really, really interesting. I, uh, I think that's, that's a little bit higher than I was expecting, if I'm being honest. But it, it, hopefully you can see from this that the, how important it is to be a good presenter and to work on these skills and to make sure that your delivery is on point. It, as I mentioned before, I was hoping that you would, you would take away these three things, but you know, the embedding video was important, but maybe this is what it is. That, that most important item is what, it, what makes a good presenter. That seems to be really important there. So I'm gonna close this out and we'll we'll go ahead and finish here. I'm gonna put up my contact information here for you. Most of you should already have it, but I'm gonna leave that here. Uh, as I mentioned before, if you have any questions, I'm gonna, I'm gonna field those now. Um, if you have to leave, I know we've just hit our one hour mark. So if you've gotta leave, I understand. Um, this is uh, the questions that we had, not many today. Um, Couple at the very beginning asking if I was sharing my screen as we worked through those technical difficulties. So thank you. Um, one suggestion is uh, I should have included in the poll. I do not wear pajamas. I don't really want to know what you wear to bed, then Cecil. So let's. Uh, I'll go ahead and just ignore that because I got a, a really bad visual there. Um, another question: Isn't that Randy in the Spider-Man suit? Well, Rick, a superhero never ideals his true uh, I, or never reveals his true identity. So I, I don't, I guess we'll never know. He's definitely the right build and the right size to fit. Now I should point is, out that that comment. Is there a, is there a senior Spider-Man? Yeah. Yeah. Senior Spider-Man. That pipe with that Spider-Man picture of that pipe, I should point out that was an 18 inch pipe. So it is more likely that it was Randy than me. Um, so it was small there. The, uh, that is, uh, let's, Thank you, Jason. Yeah. Ever since, ever since, the, your review went through and your raise, you've really not been very nice. Well, get ready, because I just had a question directed that might not seem very nice to you either. It says, the DAU slide showed included some information on something called Trandy. Someone had very good eyes. Do you know what that is? I am not familiar with what Trandy is. Randy, do you know? That sounds more like Randy. I'm going to let Randy I, ask that question. I'm I'm going to be very honest. Uh, the last time I golfed, someone said if I had a transgender name, it would be Trandy. Oh. And um, and and that that is an honest answer, and I'm still upset about that. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for your honesty. That was the last. It looks like that's the last question I had. So there's no more questions. Uh, as I mentioned before, we're going to have a a a. a, a uh, survey that's going to go out. I just forgot the word for a second. A survey that's going to go out after this asking if there's any part of this presentation uh, because it was kind of high level. If there's any part of it that you want included uh, in there that we can, uh, you know, that we can build on and, and learn more about, please answer that. Uh, thank you again for coming. I will be sending out your PDH certificate for this. Uh, hopefully by Monday you'll see that. So thank you all for joining. Uh, I, am, I am working to convert these and put these to our website. Uh, we just had some issues internally on at our national level that was running our website where the person who did that left. And so I haven't found a good replacement to upload these to our to our website yet. So I may just be creating a YouTube channel so that you can I'll upload those there so you can go back and rewatch these videos and uh, and find those that way. If you'd like them before then, if you ever want to copy of these videos or these presentations, feel free to give me a call or email and I'd be happy to help you out where I can. Thanks again, everybody, for coming today. We appreciate you taking part in these webinars. Uh, please tell your friends, share it with as many people as you want, the more the merrier. And so uh, we'd love to love to have you guys uh, and bring other people in your organizations. I will be checking the attentive score and seeing who the most interested listener was as I close this, but thanks again. Randy, Mike, anything you wanna leave as, as uh, we're closing up here? Nope, thank you, everyone. Okay, thanks, Mike. Thanks happy Easter. Happy Easter to everyone and stay safe. Yes, happy Good Friday. Happy Easter. Be safe. Thanks again, everybody. We appreciate your time. Have a good one.